G'day guys, today we're going to talk about Edward the Elder, son of Alfred the Great and possibly one of the most influential English kings of the age. That's all coming up. He was born in the year 874 and reigned from approximately 899 through to the 17th of July 924. His coronation was the 8th of June in the year 900. So obviously his predecessor was Alfred the Great and his successor was Athelstan. We'll talk about them in separate videos. So we're talking Edward the Elder. As I say, a very, very, very influential king. And when we compare him to the portrayal in the TV show The Last Kingdom, I think that we will find there's a whole lot of very significant differences. Let's take a bit more of a look at Edward the Elder. Edward inherits the throne in a time of potential peace, but I think there's a lot more chaos going on and certainly a lot more planned chaos uh, by the the so-called Vikings and the Irish and the Scots and so on. A lot of people are trying to position themselves to uh, take advantage of the power vacuum. Alfred the Great was indeed a great king. We'll talk about him fairly significantly later on. But I think what's significant here is that uh, Edward was in a, in a leadership position really when uh, there was so much potential for things to go wrong. The Dane law divided large chunks of England as it is today. The Dane law was essentially the consequence of peace that uh, King Alfred the Great had negotiated uh, with the Vikings. The Dane law included large chunks of um, Included most of East Anglia, most of uh, Northumbria, and most of Mercia. Not quite entirely. There's a, a and obviously those boundaries did shift uh, here and there at times. In early 880, we don't know exactly when. Uh, now I do apologise for my pronunciation of Old English. I'm still a bit sketchy on it. <laughs> Very sketchy, but uh, let's uh, see how we go. It is a little bit confusing here, so please try and keep up. Ethelred, Lord of the Mercians, accepts lordship by Alfred the Great and marries his daughter, Ethelfled. In the year 910, now you have to remember at this time, um, just because you were the son, especially the eldest son of an English monarch or an Anglo-Saxon monarch, didn't necessarily guarantee you ascension to the crown. Um, whilst, yes, there was a hereditary value in the crown, uh, you also had to go through the Witten. Uh, the Witten was essentially a parliament of the day by the Anglo-Saxons, and in order to get the crown, you actually needed to demonstrate kingly values. And a large part of this at this time was the ability to lead an army on the battlefield in the year 910, in the year 910, a Mercian and West Saxon army defeats a large Viking army. Edward conquers the Viking southern England, that is a large part of the southern Dane law, with Ethelfled, essentially his sister, and Ethelfled dies in the year 918. Uh, Ethelfled's daughter very briefly becomes Lady of the Mercians, but she's removed by Edward. Now this is a very contentious claim, although it's not debated by historians, but it, it is a very dark mark on Edward's name with regards to kind of modern ethics values and, and morals um, because it disrupts 
I guess, um, the, the, the female influence and female sort of leadership uh, by, by a male. Now, I, I guess we don't know the reasons for this and we don't understand, I guess, who was involved and we don't really understand about, I guess, who actually made that decision. Whilst, yes, Edward was king, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of those decisions were made by him. And certainly... Um, there, there may have been other things at stake at this time. We really just don't know. We're going to talk about Ethelfled in a different video. Um, she absolutely does deserve it. Now, when uh, Edward be, was coronated king, there was a slight succession crisis. There was a guy called Ethelwald. Now, this does the spellings do vary slightly depending on which version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle you're reading. This is the Wessex version, and Ethelwald. Um, moves in and he seizes some very large estates in places like Dorset. In response, Edward marches an army and Ethelwald um, declares that he will die where he is with his army. However, overnight, <laughs> Ethelwald picks up and runs to Nottingham where he is met by the Vikings. The Vikings actually take him essentially as a puppet king uh, now, he comes into this a bit more later on. In the year 901, Ethelwald invades Mercia. In response, Edward uh, takes around about 100 ships and invades East Anglia. After a couple of weeks, Edmund has been marching his troops around East Anglia, uh, picking off Viking strongholds. And he decides to take his troops back. However, the men of Kent refuse. And the men of Kent then march against uh, a lot much stronger Viking army. I guess they assumed they were going to get uh, support from Edward, which didn't happen. And they were pretty much all slaughtered to a man during the Battle of Holm. For the next few years, there's actually very little uh, discussion in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle about battles that uh, Edward has with the Vikings. But they obviously must have occurred. Because in the year... 906. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle states that Edward made peace out of necessity with the Vikings. Very strange that he would do that without the battle, so obviously something has happened to, to cause that to, happen, to, to occur. So, um, what Edward then does is he starts to encourage Anglo-Saxons to purchase estates in the Danelaw. And we actually know this happened because there are surviving charters that prove it happened. Now we see Edward really taking the initiative. He really does um, show very strong kingship and military leadership and goes for a very strong uh, strategic approach uh, against the, the Vikings. He's inherited a very strong military which was reformed by his father, Alfred the Great. And one of those key reforms was the construction of Anglo-Saxon burrs. Now, this wasn't necessarily... I guess um, the, the, the concept of a um, defendable village was not a concept new by Alfred the Great. However, the concept of the Burr was. So what was different about the Burr, and we've talked about this in different videos, but essentially uh, it was a place where people could go when a, an attack occurred. Um, people could grab weapons and armor and equipment. They could seek refuge and food and protection within the walls the fjord that is the anglo-saxon militia would gather and then uh, under the guidance of the huskals that is the professional warriors uh, you would see um, a response organized uh, and these fortifications were very strong very few of them are recorded as having fallen to the vikings perhaps some did but we don't really have a whole lot of evidence around that um, and certainly not long term and these fortifications provided um, future kings of England, such as Edward, with uh, the ability to coordinate resistance, to replenish armies, to maintain stores and equipment and communication lines, um, which otherwise weren't possible. And this was a, a really different kind of thing. Every Saxon lived within, roughly speaking, 20 miles of a, uh, of a birth, so there was always somewhere to go to for the large sections of the populace, uh, and, and they could seek protection uh, there. So, uh, in the year 910, we then have the Battle of Tettenhall. 
Ten Hag was a decisive defeat for the Vikings. Um, they were absolutely crushed by the Saxons, which was a, a fantastic victory uh, for Edward. Now, obviously, when we credit one person with a with a victory, we sort of ignore the fact that an army is in fact made up of many thousands of people at this time, um, and the leadership provided by Edward would actually have to translate into um, direction and strategic as well as tactical leadership by the Huskars and the Earls on the ground. Uh, it, it's not simply a case of one guy kind of taking on, you know, several thousand Vikings. From this point, Edward himself, uh, with his sister Athelflaed, start construction on, we think, around about 30 burrs. Now, you can refer to this in the Birtle Hydage. Um, and this further kind of expanded the Anglo-Saxon safety net, I guess. Um, some of these birds were around ports and some of them had access to, um, to the river systems and so on so they could further reinforce and further resupply uh, the, the Anglo-Saxon navy that had been created by Alfred the Great. It's interesting because there's quite a few documents that refer to Edward now having a lot of influence across uh, Wales. Now, Wales at this time was five independent kingdoms, so we're not quite sure exactly how much influence and how that influence had been created by Edward. It could very well have been the marriage of um, daughters of some of his earls, or perhaps some of his extended family were married into the Welsh kind of kingships. We don't really know, but that's certainly been recorded and, and shows, I guess, um, Edward not just being a military leader, but also uh, a political statesman at the time. In the year 917, the Anglo-Saxon record, Chronicle records that Edward repelled uh, a number of major attacks by the Vikings in places like Bedfordshire, Wingham, and also um, Tochester. That's very interesting, um, and it demonstrates as well that, that Edward was able to raise multiple armies at the same time to fend off these um, these invasions. In the year 918, Athelflaed uh, takes a large army and goes into what's known as the Five Boroughs. And particularly around places like Leicester, Athelflaed uh, has laid siege and the Vikings then surrendered without a fight. This is really interesting and very, I guess, uh, strategic. There's very little information recorded about Ethelfled uh, in the Saxon sources. There is some more if you go further afield into some of the Irish and Welsh chronicles. Um, and I guess looking at some of those sources, you can find that uh, Ethelfled must have had some support from further afield in order to gain this. We don't know the details, um, and that would be... It's a real shame those details have been lost to history, um, but, but there we go. I think also the fact that she was able to gain the surrender of the Vikings without a fight um, uh, obviously suggests, I guess, the credibility of Ethelfled as a leader, uh, and not only in statesmanship, but also in her own kind of military abilities. And I think that's very much downplayed, unfortunately, by the Saxons. Um, I don't really understand the reasons why it's been downplayed as much. Um, and I think there would be some personal agendas uh, which, which created that, and that's a shame. Uh, because so much information has been lost there. However, in response, the Vikings launch large attacks into um, the upper end of the, the five boroughs and they take on uh, York and York is lost. So York is an interesting place. Um, a lot of people describe York as being a Viking town uh, partially, partially that's correct, but York was uh, a, a Britonic kingdom long before the Saxons arrived. It was a Saxon kingdom for many hundreds of years uh, and then you have um, periods, I guess, of uh, ruling by the so-called Vikings and then later on by the Saxons and then it, it changes hands now and again. Um, so York is a very interesting place. It's very strategically located. Um, it's, it's a very kind of like the perfect place to put a city, really. 
so I guess you can see how it would have had um, a, a very tactical value in terms of its land placement, but also the fact that you could uh, it's on a river not very far out from the, the ocean. So it has a lot of value there. I, I think when it comes to the greater kind of kingship, we know that the main currency of Edward was the silver penny. Um, now the penny is a really interesting kind of thing because the penny is, is probably the oldest surviving currency in the world. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why England doesn't want to go to use the um, purely on the euros because it is such an old currency. Um, we have some coins that have been uh, minted as, let's say, Edward Rex on them, uh, and there's some other minting of coins which obviously uh, indicates that there were a variety of different mints operating at the time. And we'll talk about uh, coinage in a different video, uh, maybe one day, but um, it's, it's very interesting all the same. When it comes to education, Edward really continued with what his father Alfred had put into place and that was the translation of Latin scripts into um, Old English, that is the, the, the language of the time so that more people could read and understand them and I think that's fantastic. Uh, we don't have a great deal of details and evidence around um, any particular reforms that Edward himself put forward but we do know that he would have continued with his father's kind of work. In terms of religion uh, we know that Edward himself took pilgrimage to Rome to see the Pope uh, and discuss how the um, Anglo-Saxon diocese were to work uh, because there was a splitting of the diocese and that's fairly significant. In the year 920 there was a major submission of rulers within what is today Great Britain to Edmund uh, and that included a whole number of Danish kings Scottish kings, Welsh kings, um, and Cornwall and so on as well. That's very interesting because it really does kind of indicate Edward was the first, I suppose, English king. Um, and he's certainly referred to as king of the Anglo-Saxons. Unfortunately, I guess and this is one of the big problems with the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, is it's not written for historians of the, of the future. It's not written, I guess, for students of history of the future. It's, it's written, I guess, really to celebrate at the time for very specific people. And I don't suppose the people writing the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle had any idea that people, you know, a thousand years later would still be reading it. And it's very interesting that... that we have several copies of the very original Anglo-Saxon Chronicles that have survived to this day. I suppose that indicates, however, not only uh, Edward's influence as far as the, the, the military side goes, uh, that you would expect from a, a king of this particular time, but it also kind of talks a lot about um, Edward the Elder's kingship and stewardship and, and leadership of his people. I think he certainly demonstrates a great deal of respect within his own people. Um, and there's certainly no rebellions or anything like that that, that that take place. So I think Edward was generally liked and appreciated as a king. And he certainly did his job as far as uh, repelling and reducing the influence of the Vikings of the day. We don't know a whole lot about his relationship with his sister. He seems to have been brought up um, away from his sister a lot, but we really don't know a whole lot about that. Um, and certainly his relationship with his mother is very different than what is portrayed in the TV series The Last Kingdom. So in The Last Kingdom, he's portrayed basically as being, I guess, a bit of an idiot. Um, and his mother kind of has to push him to... Uh, take advice and do his job, whereas that really wasn't necessary because uh, Edward certainly seems to have been quite a proactive king of the time. Uh, and he seems to have had a very good relationship with his mother because his mother, Alfred, um, who's a very interesting woman in herself, 
and we'll do a video on her later on, but she is recorded, recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle as being a witness to at least one of Edward's charters, whereas she wasn't uh, for her husband. So that's very interesting and I think shows that um, Edward was a very respectful person of his mother. Righto guys, that's our video on Edward the Elder. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.